Well, good morning. Turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. If you do not have a Bible this morning, there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you, and we would love for you to take that and to make that Bible your own. Mark in it, underline it, put all sorts of notes in it, make it your own. We've we've just begun our our walk this spring through the Psalms. We're going to be uh, dealing with a number of assorted Psalms. Because the Psalms are about finding God in the messiness of life. And so can we just be honest for a second that life is messy, amen? Life is messy. And it starts with the fact that you are messy, okay? Can we all acknowledge that? Don't raise your hand real high, just kind of like this high so your neighbor doesn't see. But you are messy. We all have our own problems, our own internal baggage, right? From, from your overly controlling personality to the wounds you carry from your parents' divorce or being uh, underneath a hypercritical pressure situation of never feeling like you can make mistakes. Uh, we are messy enough. But then on top of that, life throws messiness at us. Right? The trials of life that come, health issues, a boss who rages, financial crisis, a complex marriage, a problematic neighbor, and a worldwide pandemic. Okay, I'm sure you are all aware that mental health experts are right now sounding the alarm, saying we are in the middle of a mental health crisis. So get this, pre-pandemic... of adults in the United States have been diagnosed with a mental health illness. 15% of youth had experienced a major depressive episode over the course of the past year. Substance abuse, suicide rates, prescription antidepressants, all skyrocketing. The American psyche is the most fragile that it has ever been And then a worldwide pandemic hits, simply magnifying our vulnerabilities. In a recent article I read, said that more than half of Americans dread 2022. What's coming in 2022? They use the word dread. Worried about the economy, inflation, supply chain, COVID, mandates. In a survey, they use words like exhausted, anxious, burned out, lonely, empty, and even that life was hellish. Claiming, I just want the ride to stop. I want off. I'm not having fun anymore. What I love about the Psalms is it provides us the hope of finding God in the messiness of life, right? When you are up to your eyeballs with emotion and you're trying to figure and sort things out and and even your mind races, the truth of the matter is God is near, that there is hope in him. This morning, we're gonna be talking about fear, about fear. And before we read Psalm 27, I need to give you a quick overview of of what takes place in the psalm so that when we read it, you'll have a better understanding. So check this out. The first six verses of the psalm, David is looking back and remembering God's faithfulness in a past situation. He is out of that danger, and he actually has found that God was enough. And so he he lifts high God's name, and he lifts high the promises that he found. But here's the deal. Verses 7 through 14 is David's current situation, and you find out he is in another fearful situation. He is scratching and he is clawing to find God's presence in the midst of that current fear. All right, so if you do me a favor and stand in honor of God's word as we read Psalm 27, 
I'm going to be reading out of the New American Standard. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. (laughs) Though a host encamped against me, my heart will not fear. Though war rise against me, in spite of this, I shall be confident. One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me and he will lift me up on a rock. And now my head will be lifted up above my enemies around me and I will offer to his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Okay, that's the end of the past. Now we move into the present. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as, as breathe out violence. I would have despaired. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. You may be seated. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your word this morning, we... We appreciate so much its sensitivity and its realness about life. Father, we are so accustomed, especially when we are out in public, to to put on an air as if everything is okay. Father, it would be a work of your Holy Spirit this morning to allow us to get honest. To allow us to get honest about the fear and trepidation of our life where our mind goes, situations that we constantly gravitate back towards. Father, so often we try and press those down and hide them and pretend like they are not controlling us. But the truth of the matter is, is Father, you know. You know what we fear. And Father, your word proclaims that you are near, that you have given your son for us that your perfect love casts out fear and allows us to overcome. So we pray this morning as your adopted sons and daughters underneath the blood of Christ that has washed away our sin, help us to walk out of our fear. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Fear is a thief that lurks in the shadows, hides around the corner, breaks in and steals peace and joy. For most of us, fear is paralyzing, leaves us frozen. While others, it stirs up rage. Sights and smells trigger hurt from the past and suddenly fear is crouching at the door. Our mind gets fuzzy as it races, as we imagine worse and worse danger. Reason is displaced by conspiracy theories and what ifs. And as if evil were not enough, we imagine evil even when it is not there. In the first six verses, 
David is thinking back into one of the most fearful times of his entire life. You see, he is a young man who has lost the counsel of Samuel, his mentor, and the comfort of his wife because she was the enemy's daughter. David is on the run from King Saul. He has done no wrong, and yet he has been accused of treason. His notoriety forces him to live outside of the cities and to fend for himself in the wilderness and to constantly stay on the move, always looking over his shoulder, waiting to keep one step, one step ahead. His small band of brothers is a laughable defense compared to the national army. Now, I highly doubt any of you here have ever been a fugitive. If so, really, do not raise your hand at this point, right? <laughs> but we can imagine what it might be like to be in David's shoes. You've had your own fearful circumstances where life was beyond your control. What do you fear the most? What is that scenario that plays over and over in your mind? And when things get quiet, you run right back to. Is it the loneliness of rejection? Being exposed as a failure and inadequate in the moment. Being judged. The horror of your loved ones getting hurt. Outside of being a coward to fear, the common response is to become overly controlling. Hyper-controlling people generally are protecting themselves against fear. Now, it's very important for me to point out to you the same as John Flavel did to me in his book, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear. That is this point, that not all fear is sinful. You see, to be human is to have natural fear because we are finite, we are dependent, we get hurt, we face situations that are beyond our control, we face evil that is more powerful than we can stand. And for those reasons and more, we have natural fear. That is not a sin. And you will have natural reactions and emotions to that, that at times feel paralyzing or get you all wound up. And hear me clearly, this is so important for you to hear. Those natural emotions are not sinful either. Even though there may be times where you, you want to feel like you need to repent of them because they stir up and you don't like how they feel. Listen, the Bible never condemns natural fear. It condemns sinful fear. So when does fear become sinful? When you don't allow God to lead you to victory. When, you're, when your view of fear begins to grow and grow and suddenly it becomes disproportionate to reality. When you compromise your character because of your fear of man. When you and others around you are exhausted because you're a control freak. You see, it's what you do with natural fear that determines if it becomes sinful. And the source of sinful fear is unbelief. You see, because God is too small and man is too big and your view of God's promises towards you are too small. In Isaiah chapter 7, Ahaz is king of Judah and suddenly he is being attacked because northern Israel has teamed up with Aram and they are coming with an army that is way too big and they are on the doorstep. But God has seen, and God sent word through Isaiah to go and to tell King Ahaz, do not worry, 
I see you. I am with you. Do not fear. So think about this for a moment. Put yourself in Ahaz's shoes, right? There is this initial natural fear that rises up. It's the weight and responsibility of being the king. He's a leader. He has to think about his people and his, natu- and his national resources. But when Isaiah shows up and says, listen, God has a promise for you. God is with you. He sees you. Do not fear. Suddenly, it is now a question of belief. But how big is God in Ahaz's mind? Now, what you find in this situation is not big enough. As the mounting army comes against him, as his mind races, as he dwells on it, that army grows. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And he forms an alliance with Assyria, right? He takes control. Assyria is the rising rising superpower. And so he forms an alliance with them. And it sets off a series of generational consequences. And you ask the question, why? You see, because his faith in God was too small. While his fear of what man could do to him grew and grew, and it was so big. The Bible would say it like this. He feared horses and chariots rather than fearing God Almighty. Friend, let me ask you a question this morning about your own fears. How big is God? Has the eternal king given promises to you? And is he able to keep them? Or can man, who must sleep away a third of his life, who has seasonal allergies and can't even look at the sun, can man thwart God's plans and promises towards you? You see, fear means God is too small and man is too big. But the third portion of unbelief that I mentioned previously is that you are exaggerating. While you are exaggerating what man can do to you, you also diminish what God thinks of you. That is his promises towards you. Think with me back into Genesis and the account of Abraham. Abraham, God has given promises to, right? He is promised an heir through Sarah that he would be the father of many nations so that he would have an heir, that he would be the father of many nations. And not only that, that all the nations of the entire world would be blessed through him. Well, circumstance has it. There is a famine in the land that causes him and Sarah to have to go down to Egypt to sojourn because of that famine. Now, Abraham is afraid. He is afraid because his wife is beautiful. And he is afraid that now as he goes into this foreign land, circumstances that he can't control, that are unknown, that the powerful people in the land will find his beautiful wife and kill him. So what does he do? He takes control of the situation. And he compromises his own integrity, and even the integrity of his wife. He gave his wife away to another man. Twice. Wanting to take control. Sinful fear, compromising character. Beloved, in your fear, have you forgotten that your father delights in you? Abraham sure did, right? When you and I read that account, what do you say? After you've read the whole account, you you want to shake Abraham. You want to say, no, 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 don't you understand? You have the promises of God. God is on your side. He has promised. It will come to pass. He will fulfill. He is faithful, his promises. Hold on. What would you say to yourself? Have you diminished the promises that God gives to you? 
Back in Isaiah, after rebuking Ahaz, God speaks to Isaiah personally, as he does to his, his own, his own son. And he says, listen, do not fear what they fear. You fear me, God says. Do not fear what they fear. You fear me. You see, fear drives men. The carnal man is driven to his earthly resources to control all that he can. His worry and anxiety drive him to compromise his character. Or fear will drive you to God. To God. As it does David here. So to reset the situation in your mind, David, in this first part of the psalm, he is hunted by King Saul and the national army. He is a fugitive. He is surrounded. He is filled with natural fear, but not sinful fear. You know why? Because God is near. Because God's presence, like a helicopter, is able to lift David above his circumstance, is able to give him a supernatural peace of God's presence in the midst of that circumstance. Suddenly David starts talking like he is, he is back at the temple. He is in God's presence. He is worshiping. He can sense God's nearness so much. He, he is like he is back at the temple. And then he, he makes a reference to Moses being hid in the cleft of the rock. And David says, you hide me in the cleft of your rock. In that moment, David finds that God is near. Victory over fear. Listen again to verse 1. Because this is David's testimony to us. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. The Lord is my light. He allows me to see. And my salvation whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold. He is where I hide. He is where I find rest of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Drink that in. Beloved, drink that in. The victory in God on the other side of fear. Because that is being offered to you. This morning, that in Jesus Christ, you have been adopted as God's own, and He speaks to you and He calls you to Himself, and He says, Do not fear what they fear, fear me. And He offers that drink of peace. For those who are his. Do you need that? Do we need that? I mean in an overly anxious. Just like this all the time. Culture. Do we need to just be able to drink that in? Listen to David. Listen to the offer of those who are gods. In Christ Jesus. All right, but check this. This is, this is what I love about the Bible and especially this psalm, right? So we just had that landing place, right? And you're just like, oh man, what a beautiful picture. Now catch this because this psalm doesn't hide the messiness of life. Okay, the, the whole first section of the psalm, David has been looking back to the past. He looks back, he remembers that time, he remembers that peace that he had that was overcoming fear, but now he finds himself in the middle of a new, most fearful situation of his life. It's a new one. And guess what? He's afraid again. It's not like a one and done, like, all right, I overcame that fear. There's no more fear anymore. Rather, he's afraid. He's terrified. He 
is filled with natural fear that rises up based on his circumstances. He is surrounded again. Look at verse 12. Because there are false witnesses who are maligning his reputation. He says they are breathing out violence against him. He is afraid. But it gets even worse because look at verse 10. These accusations are so widespread that David has reason to believe that even his own father and mother have abandoned him. Not only does he fear harm, but he fears the loss of relationships. Those are at stake too. Being abandoned, forsaken, feeling utterly alone. Guys, our greatest fears are fears of rejection. Being found inadequate, being embarrassed in front of our peers. Did you know that last year the number one Google search for fear was fear of failure? And this stat continues. I know you've heard it before, but let this sink in. 75% of people fear public speaking more than death. (laughs) I mean, that means at a funeral, you would rather be in the casket than where I stand having to speak at one. (laughs) Why is that? Have you ever thought about that for just a second? Why is that? It's because of relationship rejection. The shame of being exposed as a failure and a fraud. Not having the words to come out and feeling all of those eyes on you. You see, David's character is being maligned. And all these fears are rising up in him. So what does he do about it? First, he looks back. And he remembers God's faithfulness in the past. He remembers who he is in God. And he remembers, God, you overcome. And he praises God for that. But hear me. That's not enough. In this circumstance, that's that's not enough. Because fear has yet again crouched at his door. It is right there. And these emotions rise up. And he can't just say, well, well, let me just pretend they're not there. Or or you overcame them in the past. That's not enough. Listen to him scratch and claw for faith. Verse 7, hear me, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. And be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. You see, David in this moment is Fighting the fight of faith. He's saying, Jesus, I need you now. I need to sense your nearness now. The the fear of man is growing. Fear in the situation is growing. And you 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 are distant from me. You are getting smaller and smaller. Do not hide your face from me. See, he's fighting for faith. He says, I am but dust. What have I if I don't have you? I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Finding the presence of God in the messiness of life. When you see that this is what it looks like, even for David. There's one final point I want to make, and then we're done. 
That is this, that we find God in the midst of fear. That God uses fear. And that God makes you face your fear and to see it for what it is. So often we want to pretend that what it means to abide in God is that, is that we'll be able to navigate around all fearful circumstances, that we just won't have those obstacles, that life will just go, oh, no fear. Gideon is one of my favorite biblical narratives, and mainly because of its thread on fear. In Judges chapter 6, when the curtain is drawn back, we find Gideon threshing out grapes, uh, sorry, threshing out wheat in a wine press. You're supposed to do that on the top of a hill. But Midian, the great army, has come against, and Gideon has a hundred reasons to be filled with fear. At the top of that list is they have killed his brothers. They have stolen and ravaged their food and their land, and everyone is filled with fear. But when God shows up, he calls Gideon into his fear. He must face his fears. God tells him, tear down the town altar. <clears throat> where they're worshiping false gods. <clears throat> He's told, Gideon, I need you to lead the army. And Gideon's like, uh, but I'm the youngest of a really small, you don't want me. He's tasked with defeating an army initially that's four times larger than their own. And then God on top of that says, no, 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 the numbers are too good. You might think that you actually won that battle. And he whittles the army all the way down to 300 versus 130,000. Into fear, into fear, into his fears. God called Joshua into the land of giants. Moses into the presence of Pharaoh. Daniel into the lion's den. David into the fight with Goliath. David previously had already faced his fears from the past, but here in Psalm 27, he is yet again faced with more fear. Friend, I have found that to walk with God is to face your fears. That bravery isn't the absence of fear, it's finding God while surrounded by fear. It's this reason that the bravest act in all of human history was when Jesus prayed three times in the garden. Have you ever asked yourself, why does he pray three times? The reality is he's fighting for faith. He's fighting to find God's presence and to sense his nearness. Even if he found peace in the moment as he gets up and walks away, he needs to come back and he needs to come back because he's fighting to find God in the midst of fear, surrounded by it, knowing what awaits. He needs God's presence. Beloved, that's bravery, not the absence of fear, finding God and overcoming where are you this morning? Do you dread 2022? Are you paralyzed by fear? Do you lack conviction about God's promises towards you? Are you afraid to take risks for God's kingdom? Has COVID revealed that your entire foundation has been based on a worldly system that is always subject to change? Does your mind race while you try and control the uncontrollable? I plead with you, come, come. Let us return to the unshakable one, the one who has offered us an unshakable kingdom. And may we collectively be a people that is filled with courage, 
that we overcome the fear of our culture and even individual fears. That we link arms and we help one another in such a way that we say, come, come, come to the unshakable one. He has helped me. He can help you. Will you pray with me? Our heavenly father, what we love about your word is that it's able to get real with us about the messiness of life and Father, about what we hope in and what we trust in, even on top of that, how life can overwhelm us and cause us to be filled with fear. This morning, Father, I pray all across this room that you would be searching us and calling us forward to yourself so that we might lay down our fears. And trust, Father, that you are bigger and that your promises towards us, even if we don't always feel like it, your promises towards us say that nothing shall overtake us but that you will work all things out for our good and for your glory. And we shall not fear with sinful fear, but rather our fear and delight in you will overcome. We pray all of this strong name of Jesus Christ.